morning. Good morning, Katie. <laughs> Let's try that again. <laughs> good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Hello. Good morning. Welcome this morning to Redeemer Bible. Um, I want us to take a moment and head towards memory lane just for a second. Think back towards your playground days, right? And you're out on the playground and you guys are getting ready to play a pickup game, right? You're gonna split up in teams, so you have two captains and they pick through the kids that are there and you happen to be the last one standing and they're like, all right, come on, Katie. One will take you off the you know? Right? Oh, it happened a few times. But, you know, I know that's a, like a minor memory, right? But, you know, it's, it's impactful. It remains with us, right? You know, when they choose you and they're kind of like, begrudgingly, they take you on and they're like, all right, fine, we'll, we'll let you kind of hang out with us and try and play, right? Well, how much more impactful then this morning is the impact of when the Spirit softened our hearts and the beloved one, Jesus, whispered, your debt is paid for me. When we're openly greeted by our new father by name and arms open freely, he says, welcome to my family, not begrudgingly or ashamed. Our life now unshackled, but with nothing in our hands. Simply the lavishly loved riffraff he adopted. He brings us to his overflowing table, clean and made pristine. As we look around the table, our stories are similar, equalizing in fact. We are all undeserving but love all the same. So I will end as Paul began. Blessed is the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavens, in Christ. Let us now together worship our Father. We just enjoyed, uh, especially in the first song, words that will come back to us now out of the scriptures, Lord, that you have inspired, you've breathed them out, we've heard them in song, we're going to hear them in word now. And basically what we hear, what we've heard in song, and what we will hear from the word is, Father in heaven, that you, as a father of a very large family, a father to a son, a father who desired to have a lot of sons and daughters, basically from the misfits of the world, basically from the rejects and the ones no one wanted, and you've made them into a family. And we hear the call to praise you. There's a lot of dads who don't receive a whole lot of praise. They're hardworking. Bless them today as they attempt to emulate you. There are many fathers who are self-centered. They leave their children. Work is more important to them. Paycheck, the boat, the golf handicap, the car. Life's all about them. But we want to turn, Lord, everyone's attention towards you to see what kind of a father you are, what you've done, what your schedule is like. And I pray that every mouth that's stopped and every mouth that's some shut here this morning will begin to open and give you the praise and the blessing that it deserves. So do what I cannot do, Lord. Bring praise in our hearts to you, the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Do it around the world, wherever the name of Jesus is presented and preached and taught, regardless of the church, how poor it might be, how thin it might be, whether it's in North Korea somewhere, Cuba, Somewhere where Christianity is illegal, honor and bless the preaching of Jesus everywhere. Knock Satan down, give him a bloody eye, kick him below the belt, Lord. Let him be defeated this day, we pray, for your glory in Christ's name. From Jim, Jim Dent's book, 
12 mighty orphans, of which Vern Lundquist of CBS Sports says this just might be the best sports book ever written. And I concur, and I've read a few. He writes, Orphans in the 1900s were stigmatized as a strange breed. They were viewed as misfits with physical deformities and little on the brain. They were outcasts. It did not matter that they had not done anything wrong. Kids without parents were simply second-class citizens. One of the most celebrated social experiments in the history of the U.S. occurred in the mid-1800s until 1929, and it did nothing to improve the image of downtrodden orphans. Unwanted children from northeastern cities like Baltimore, New York City, Boston, were herded onto trains traveling <clears throat> west at depots along the way. They were parceled out like mailbags to prospective takers. The children were lined up on a platform for all to see and to feel. They were coped, they were prodded to ascertain their value as workers on farms or in factories. In most cases, they were just another piece of meat. They were checked for the structure of their muscle. Their teeth were checked. The strong were usually chosen right away and normally forced into hard labor. But on the other hand, the young, the sickly, and the weak normally didn't make the cut. A heavily populated orphan train from New York City made its final stop in Fort Worth, that's Texas, where it turned around and headed back east with all the kids who were unchosen. Fort Worth was the last chance for the kids not chosen along the way. Fortunately, all the orphans found in Fort Worth had a guardian angel. He was a Christian pastor. And he gathered up all those orphans, all the unadoptable, unwanted misfits, the weakly, the sickly, the deformed. And he found homes for all of them in the city of Fort Worth, and he created an orphanage for them. It's little wonder that Fort Worth became known as the friendliest place to downtrodden children in the hardest years of the Depression. Fast forward to 1992. A biracial boy was born April 26th. If you know anything about adoption, Nobody wants biracial kids. They want someone pure. This little boy was born and his future did not look right. But a Christian father and a Christian mother who could not have children themselves, Patty and Wayne, had decided they wanted him. Went through the hoops, the legal hoops, to get this little boy, this biracial boy. And they adopted him the day after he was born. And they gave him an Old Testament name because they were believers and wanted to designate him with a Christian name. As he later on said in his life when he grew up, and it's someone that everyone knows here and knows, and you've probably seen him as well. He said, when I was about 10 or 11, and I realized my mom and dad didn't look like me, I began to ask them questions. And they said, well, you're adopted. And that prompted all sorts of questions, which they answered graciously. And that was fine with me. It didn't really bother me, because that was the only, they were the only parents I ever knew. The parents that adopted me were the ones that raised me, and that's how it is. Later on, as you listen to him, he is, of course, he was looked at as a misfit. But the one thing he does, he praises God and he praises his dad and mom. That's what Paul wants us to do this morning in Ephesians chapter 1, verse 5 and 6. He wants us to look at our Father and he wants us to praise him. 
And the reason is twofold. This is what I'm going to talk about this morning from Ephesians 1, 5 and 6. Uh, chapter 3, excuse me, chapter 1, verse 3 through 14 is the second longest sentence in the New Testament. And it begins with blessed. And it gives a series of blessings. A series of spiritual blessings that the Father, rooted in the Father's heart, rooted in His love, is to be praised for. And the one we want to focus on today is the word predestination. I know it's a dirty word to a lot of people. It's not supposed to create an argument. It's supposed to create praise. And God has predestined the misfits, the downtrodden, and predestined them in eternity to be his sons and daughters. And so, what I'm telling you is that before there was a universe, before there was a, such a thing as time, the Father, yes, he's always been a Father. There's never been a time in eternity when God was not a Father and when his Son was not a Son and they enjoyed that perfect relationship working in tandem to save people. The Father predestined believers to be part of his family. And as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 26, God overlooks the powerful, he overlooks usually the wealthy and the influential, he overlooks the celebrities, and he purposely marks out as his own the misfits and the weaklings of society. And the reason is that at the end of time, God will make a point to shame the powerful and the wealthy and the celebrity. He will make a point of making them ashamed because they take the glory to themselves. But when we realize that God has adopted the misfits and changed them, God gets the glory. So come with me. Come with me in Ephesians 1. Join me for a few minutes as we talk about, let's praise our Father. Blessed, this is a declaration, blessed is the God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. He's the one who has blessed us with every, or all, I think every is the best because what Paul is telling us here is that all the blessings that were necessary to transfer us from the kingdom of darkness into God's family, everyone was unloaded out of God's treasure box. Nothing was left. He is the one who has blessed us, favored us, with every blessing of the Spirit, every blessing enacted and operated by the Spirit in the heavenly places in Christ, verse 4, just as He chose us, elected us in Christ before the foundation of the universe so that they would be holy and blameless before Him. The next phrase, in love, is the one that starts, verse 5, even though it's located in verse 4. In love, let's talk about what love is. Love is not romance. Love is not the word affection. Love means to put someone else's interests above our own. Love means we do something out of their best interest instead of ourselves. Love is what gets a mother up in the middle of the night to change a baby's diaper. It's not that she has such affection for changing diapers. She doesn't dream about changing dirty diapers. What does she do? Why does she do that? She does it because she has the child's best interest at heart. That's love. So in love, God did something. The word here is pro. Pro in Greek always means ahead of time. Beforehand. Pro horizo. Pro horizo. It's a compound word. God pro horizo us. He predestined us to huiathesion. He predestined us to, now we have a word, that is a combination of two ideas, sonship and adoption. He predestined us, he made this transaction and predetermined that in time, when we were born, one day we would hear the gospel and we would be saved. He determined that it would be so. And so, in other words, everybody that he predestined to sonship, they had to believe. They had to believe when the gospel was presented. We'll talk about predestination in just a minute in terms of what it means. But he predestined us to sonship through Jesus Christ to himself according to 
the good pleasure of his will to the praise of the glory of his grace. We heard that in the song this morning, the first song we sang, which he graced us in the beloved one. All right, let's think about what Paul is telling us. Our key word, or at least one of the key words, is the word huia, the sion, sonship. Remember in Greek, first century Greek, anytime there is a group of male and female together, Greek always defaults to male. This is why the word in your Bible says sonship. But it doesn't mean sonship only. Just like when Paul wrote to the Galatians, in his epistle to the Galatians, he addresses them as brothers. Why? Because the Galatian church is made up of male and female. But in first century Greek, the default is always to male. So when you read the text, it doesn't mean that we're going to say brothers and then we kind of add sisters. No. Brothers means brothers and sisters. So when it comes to adoption, when Paul talks to us about adoption to sonship, that's simply male default. That's the normal habit. But it includes what? Sonship and daughtership. I know there's no such a word. But I'm making it up because it's true. God has predestined, foreordained, predetermined that there would be certain boys and girls and certain men and women who would be brought into his family, brought to himself on the basis of adoption. We'll talk about adoption in just a minute. But I'll just go back to that word that I've been pointing to over there by that door. Predestination. Horizo, pro horizo, is from the word, or what we get our word, horizon. So when you go to the beach this afternoon, or you've been to the beach and you look out, what do you see? What do you see when you look out at the water? You see two things. You see the sky, and then you see water, and then what's in the middle? What's in the middle? What's the dividing line between sky and water? It's the horizon. It's from what we get the word horizontal, means it's this way. Not this way. So this is the word. Horizon. What is a horizon? It's a boundary between sky and the Gulf of Mexico. Sky and water. So what did God do when he predestined us? When he predestined you to believe and to become a child of God or something, what did he do? Before there was a universe, he put a boundary around you. He put a boundary around you personally. He saw you as a girl or as a boy. He put a boundary around you and said, this girl is going to be mine. It belongs to me. And predestined you to be adopted into the family. But you say to me, but wait a minute, I chose Christ. That's true. But why did you choose Christ? Because of that decision made in eternity. So God marked you as his own. Before there was a chance for you to say no. God predetermined that one day you'd be in the family. Now just stop and think about that. What does that tell you about our Father in heaven? What does that tell you about our Father in heaven? You've heard a lot of stories about a lot of dad, bad dads. You've heard a lot of stories, and the dad's concern is not his kids and not his family. It's all about making money. It's all about going to the top. It's all about being a, a famous person, applause. The job is more important than the kids. But you know what? Not with our Father. Our Father's concern is not only his glory, and as Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 1.26, he says to the Corinthian congregation, not many of you were what? Strong. But God chose the weak of the world in order to shame the strong. So what God did is he went to this orphanage before time. He went to the orphanage of humanity and he saw all the rejects, all the misfits, 
all the boys and girls and all the men and women who had made mistakes, made fools of themselves, they were weak, they didn't make much money, they're the kind of people you kick to the curb, they're the people who would never make it in the clique because they were too ugly, their ears were too big, the clothes they wore were from Walmart or Goodwill, they wore flabby shoes, they stunk, they had fleas, they lived in shabby houses. None of the people that impressed anybody else, and God says, I want them in my family. Because those people, once they have become redeemed and controlled by the Spirit and God begins to develop them, they become portraits of Jesus, his son, and God gets the glory. What does that tell you about our Father? What does that tell you about our Father in Heaven? He can take the worst and make them like His Son. And He overlooks the people who think they're so cool, the people on the stages, the people who refuse to look at the man on the cross and give God the glory for the praise they receive. God intends to humiliate them on the day of judgment. You looked at yourself on the stage and you did not look at that humiliating creature on the tree called the cross of Calvary. And God has a day of reckoning for all of them. God will humiliate them. But he will lift up those he has chosen. Those specimens of humanity that everybody rejects. This word, predestined, is used again in a context that I wish that you would turn to with me for a minute in Acts 4.23. The word predestined is used for the cross of Jesus. Look with me for a minute. Verse 23 of chapter 4. As soon as they were freed, Peter and John returned to the other believers. And they told them what the priests and elders had said. And when they... The believers heard the report. All the believers lifted up their voices together in prayer to God. This is what they said. O sovereign Lord, creator of heaven and earth, the sea and everything in them, you spoke long ago by the Holy Spirit through our ancestor, David, your servant, saying, and now the congregation quotes Psalm 2, which is messianic, pointing ahead to Jesus. Why did they waste their time? with feudal plans. Why are the nations so angry? The kings of the earth prepared for battle. The rulers gathered together against the Lord, against his Messiah. Verse 27. In fact, this is what happened here in this city. King Herod, Pontius Pilate, the governor, the Gentiles, and the people of Israel were all united against Jesus, your holy servant whom you anointed. But, here's the verse, verse 28. All their actions, the actions of Pilate, the actions of Herod, the actions of the elders, and the actions of the priests, all their actions were predetermined, predestined beforehand according to your will. Same word, pro horizo. So the cross of Jesus was not an accident. The cross of Jesus was not a tragedy. The cross of Jesus, the rejection, the denial of Peter, the betrayal of Judas, the false witnesses at the trial of Jesus, all of that had been planned and orchestrated, and every one of those people simply carried out the will of God. The cross, the means of our salvation, was foreordained, predestined by God. This is why Paul says, let's praise our Father. God made a decision in eternity to create a family like his son. And he chose and predestined them one day to be adopted. In Roman law, if a couple had no children and they wanted children, they had an option. They could adopt a boy or a girl. And when that boy was adopted or that girl was adopted, they immediately had all the adult privileges and responsibilities 
of a natural born child. So that when the parents died, the adopted child inherited everything dad and mom gave them. Perfectly equal to a natural born. Paul uses that to say, the reason, or the reason that we came into the family of God is not our natural birth, but due, due to adoption and adoption only. And now we are fully equal sons and daughters in the family of God. To put it this way, our Father does not see us as His children as inconveniences or a burden. He sees them as a joy. He sees us as a joy. He's glad we have our children. He's glad that we are his children. He wanted you. He wanted you. You're not a mistake. It's not a mistake. You heard Christ one day preached and you trusted him. That's not a mistake. God ordained that. This gives great confidence to parents to pray for their children. Because hopefully one day one of their children, whether they're teens or little kids, activated by the Spirit, they will trust them. Good friends of ours, you have met some of them before, were stationed in Asia. They used to visit an orphanage on a regular basis. They wanted to adopt a little boy. A little boy that never smiled. Never smiled. So they could rent a child for the weekend. So they would take the child home and then return Sunday night. Sort of like rent a car, rent a child. And they decided to adopt this little boy who never smiled. But they said there's a catch here. You can't adopt him unless you adopt his sister. She's here too. And so they did. People that nobody else wanted, they took. And they've been here. And perhaps you've met them. And the little boy is now a power lifter. He's quite impressive. And he does smile. I've seen him. The next thing that I would like us to see in this chapter is verse 6. Paul calls on us to praise our Father because <laughs> it gave him pleasure. It gave him pleasure to adopt us. Let's read it. He predestined us to sonship or daughtership through Jesus Christ according to the good pleasure of his will to the praise and the glory of his grace which he graced to us in his beloved. I can go on, there's other, wor other words and other phrases that we can discuss here, but what we want to learn about our, our spiritual father in heaven, here at the end of verse 5 and carrying on into verse 6, is that uh, God had a choice, and it's a choice that no one twisted his arm for, no one browbeat him, threatened him, he did it on his own, it was a free choice to make us his children. And for the rest of our day, Paul calls on us to let our, loop, let our lips be in praise of our Father in heaven. He's a good Father. He's the best Father in the universe. And we belong to the best family ever. And this is a great model for all dads. We'll talk about some takeaways here. But this is a great model for dads. Just look at your life right now. Dads. If God gave you some children, they are your priority. And the way you live your life is going to impact them greatly. Not on the basis of what you say you believe. They don't care what you say you believe. What they care about is your actions, your schedule, what you do. And they will later on, when they get older, look back and look at the choices dad and mom made, the decisions they made, the schedules they keep, that's what they'll remember, that's what they'll use for their own life 
But they're going to remember not what you said. Oh, I love Jesus. I love you. They're going to say, no, your decisions and your choices said you loved yourself more than you loved me. And they will make an effort never to be like you. If you're headed down that path today, your fatherhood looks like it's all about me. Take warning. One day your kids are going to look at you and say, you are a selfish dad. They're going to say that. And they have every right to say it. And I'll be with them saying, he's right. She's right. I looked at your personal life. It's all about you. Life is not about you. The father took a risk in adopting us. That's what dads do. They take a risk and put their children's interests above their own. It's not what I want to do today. I want to go fishing. I want to go out and boat. No. My children need me to focus on them and their spiritual birthright and their spiritual progress. That's dad's responsibility. Some takeaways that maybe will impact the way we live our lives. I had six, but I know that time-wise I could only work on a couple. And I've already kind of started my way into it, but some things come to my mind. If you're working on a difficult marriage right now, and you're, that's not, you're not the only one. If, if you're having a difficult marriage right now, and there's some struggles, okay. What can you do for the best interest of your children? What's the best thing to do for the interest of your children? Quit? Throw in the towel? I give up? What, what should a married couple do that's struggling with each other? Best interest of the children is to say, you know, I need to humble myself and look into my own life and see what it is that I'm doing what it is that I am saying, my activity, my schedule, my attitudes, my words, my value system, what can I do to change? You can't change your partner. They have to change. But you yourself can be responsible for what it's necessary for you to do. Show them an example. Focus on your decisions, your actions, your schedules, and let that say, my marriage is important for the sake of my kids. They need an example to watch when they become dads and moms. So if you need help to do that, ask for help. Ask for help. You'll get it. You may not like what you hear, but if you're willing to be humble and receive the truth, progress will be made. And your children will say, you tried. You gave it your best shot. At least to you, they can say that. Make every effort to work through those challenges by the grace of God, with the help of God, and by asking for help. Every child deserves a dad and mom working together in peace and in harmony and in love. That's what every child deserves. You can give it to them. You can give it today. You can pick up the phone today or have a conversation with your spouse and say, you know what, I've been the one that's selfish and proud. I don't want anybody else to know that we're having problems. And say what? I need help. God help me. And reach out to Israel. For the sake of your children. This is like our Father in Heaven. Show them evidence. Not by your words. Your words are worthless. They don't care what you say. They care what you do. Secondly, adoption was the only way that God could bring us into his family. Adoption is the only way sometimes in this world that a child will receive family love and be able to hear about the love of God in Jesus Christ. So, my hat is off to everyone here who is considering adoption or who has adopted and all those in the Carlton Manor ministry with the boys and with the girls because those kids do not have parents. In many ways they're orphans and you take the time to visit them and to be with them. And if you're interested in making a difference in an orphan's life 
talk to James, talk to Kelly, talk to Deborah Bard about when and where to show interest in these orphans who are great in our community and have no father and mother. Third, because all of us are in the family of God, those who have trusted Christ, because we're in the family of God only on the basis of adoption, somebody else's decision, not ours. Somebody else wanted us in the family. Because of that, there's no room left in Jesus' church. And this church, there's no room left for any sort of click, pride, or considering myself better than somebody else. No basis for racism at all. I find it interesting that today, back in 1901, today, September the 3rd, a state in this country adopted a new state constitution accepted by the population of the state that there could be no interracial marriages. It became a law. <laughs> I don't know how more anti-Christ you can be than that. It's unbelievable. state constitution included no interracial marriage. Why? Because whites were superior to blacks. It's like, what Bible are you reading? And that happened in the Bible Belt. Of course. No room for racism. No room for second class citizens. No room in the church for cliques. None. We're all here as orphans. Due to the love Has the Father made a difference in your life? The good Father in heaven? Then open your mouth. Let your tongue loose and praise Him for the remainder of your life. We have the best Father. We're going to the best heaven. And it'll be forever. All because in eternity, God drew a boundary on her and said, She's mine. He's mine. And a billion others. Recently, that little boy, that little biracial boy, who nobody wanted to adopt, but two men, or excuse me, not two men, a man and a woman, two people, father and a mother, Christians, said we want him. They adopted him, and he was the one who today, he was the one who today wears the uniform of a New York Yankee. And he was the one who tied the record for hitting home runs set by Roger Maris back in 61. Some tributes to his mom and his dad. Listen to these words. I knew I wouldn't be a New York Yankee if it wasn't for my mom. If it wasn't for my mom. The guidance she gave me as a kid growing up, knowing the difference between right and wrong, how to treat people, how to go the extra mile, and put in the extra work, all that stuff, she molded me into the person I am today. Aaron Judge. One of the greatest baseball players that ever played the game. All because why? Daddy and mom said, we will take the unadoptable. We'll take them. His dad? He said, my dad still stays at the top of my role model list. He's always been my hero. I'm always a guy who looked up to him. 
And because of that, he does what other New Yorkers have never done. He avoids the nightlife. He has social media accounts, but I love what this social media account says. It's his. Christian, faith, family, then baseball. <laughs> and at the top of the page, he quotes 2 Corinthians 5, 7, for we walk by faith, not by sight. So I wonder, if he hadn't been adopted by his Christian parents, where would he be today? Where would he be today? Probably in prison. Thank you for listening. Let's let our tongues loose and praise our God. Let's stand and let's pray. Thank you for listening. call us to praise you, Father, and not for small reasons. You determined our destiny. No one told you to. You didn't have to. You weren't obligated to. You did it freely. Because of your love for us, your loving Father, truly the greatest, if not one of the greatest gifts this universe ever has is to know that it's ruled by a loving Father. And you wanted us in your family. Transform us. This church, these people, marriages, parents, individuals, singles, old, young. Transform us into men and women and boys and girls who reflect the love of the Father. Free from prejudice and bias and discrimination. Free from selfishness, a self-focus, pride, and the refusal to ask for help when needed. Give grace to everyone here who needs to make some changes in their practice, their schedule, their activities, and their focus on their kids. Give encouragement to the discouraged. Peace and harmony to marriages. One day we will gather at your throne and we will thank you. I pray that all the kids who are being adopted will one day say thank you to their dads and moms. To let them know everything they did for them, all the sacrifices they made, all the hoops they jumped through was worth it. May that begin here and start a train of orphans who give you praise. Thank you in Jesus' name. It's for you. This blessing is the one we did last week, taken from Ephesians 1, 17 and 18. We don't have any blessings last Mary. We don't have, so I am just going to bless you. And you can say thanks be to God at the end. All right. May the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, give us spiritual wisdom and insight in our growing knowledge of him. Our minds have been given light so that we are able to understand this confident hope, that we are called to be his people and to receive his rich, glorious inheritance, and so we can perceive the incomparable greatness of his power toward us who believe. So let us go forth with renewed hope about our tomorrow. Thank you, God. Amen.